And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, this is a this is a special occasion. Uh, we have, I think, in our organization, just a lot of fun. And 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 Chris and Daryl. Well, Daryl, people may not know this may be the first time they've seen you. Daryl, put up your hand and and expose your thank you. <laughs> and say Daryl is a retired. Uh, Systems analyst, engineer, known him for decades. Could we say that decades? Yeah, eighty-three, and, and 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 has a heart of trying to help other people uh, when it comes to investing, and has done so much for us. We have tons of tables because of Daryl's work. Uh, the, the, some of the best stuff that we have, and and Chris Patterson, uh, if you're new to us, he is our director of research. And and uh, he has done marvelous work uh, in the uh, the best in class ETF identified uh, recommendations. Which, by the way, Chris, you're having a great year. I don't know if you've taken a look at how your recommendations are doing, but it's just absolutely. one year. It's just one year. <laughs> you know, all right, all right. Well, that's the only one we got this year. But I will tell you, uh, the diversification has been working beautifully. Anyway, Chris does wonderful work in helping in the two funds for life that he developed. And some time ago, uh, Craig Apple came into our life. Craig, you're the only guy left here, so <laughs> there we go. And he came to our organization and made us an offer we could not say no to, and that is to uh, he let us use uh, the the calculator, the lifetime investment calculator that we have on our site. And uh, Craig, I don't know how often you are talking to people who are using it. Uh, are you still talking to them? Are they are they writing with questions and 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 applauding your work? Uh, yeah, about every month we get a, an email or two, uh, no, just uh, folks checking it out. That's good. Well, it's 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 a wonderful tool for people to use. And you're kind of special in this group because, well, Chris used to be the young guy. And, of course, that meant Daryl and I had a little jealousy, a little envy about that. And then you come along and uh, now you're the you're the kid on the block. And, and, and so we are thrilled to have you as a part of the team. That's number one. But number two, you did something recently that I think is uh, very interesting. You, uh, We've talked for hours about, about your goals for, for, for saving and investing and, 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 uh, and you live, you live the life that you, uh, that, that you actually uh, t uh, talk about. As I recall, you do not have a car. Is that correct? That's correct. I live in a major city and uh, living, you know, a couple miles from the city center in a very small apartment allows me to uh, to take public transport or rent a vehicle when I need to go out into the mountains. I think this is what the world might look like someday, huh? We'll see. Anyway, Craig did something that I thought was fascinating. Tell the story about the, the Chautauqua and uh, how you found out about it, why it was important to you, and then tell us, start the story about what it is, because it has to do with a group of people that we actually don't know as much about as we, as we should, because they are generally younger investors who, uh, who, who have a commitment to financial independence at a level, like you say, you ride a bike, you walk, you live in a small apartment. You have a commitment to, to financial independence that makes, that makes it special. Let us know about the Chautauqua, what, what, what happened there and uh, the lessons you learned. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to share my experience. Uh, with the with the foundation's audience, um, you know, I I hope that this is you know my story is helpful for you or for people that you know in your world. Um, you know, my kind of path is only one of 
many, and we all have a unique version uh, that we're trying to, to pursue for ourselves. Um, so as Paul said, I have been uh, pursuing financial independence. And so what that means is that there is a version of enough um, that, uh, you know, that I need to make to have a baseline income uh, from the investments that I hold. Uh, and so that income can come from dividends. It can come from kind of just withdrawing a percentage of the portfolio on a regular uh, basis. Um, and so financial independence is a math calculation where you have, uh, you identify a safe withdrawal rate that works for you. And, uh, you know, that's based on how much it costs you to live right now and how much you think it will cost for you to live uh, when you reach financial independence. Uh, and then from there, it's just identifying what your, uh, what your number is. So if you uh, kind of the typical scenario that is, uh, that is often cited is a 4% safe withdrawal rate and someone living on $40,000 a year uh, would need to generate that out of a portfolio. Um, and so you take $40,000 and you multiply it by 25 and you get a million dollars. So if your portfolio has a million dollars in it, um, the idea is that you could safely withdraw uh, $40,000, your living expenses uh, from that portfolio every year. And on average, uh, have a high likelihood of uh, keeping that principle uh, in your investments without running out of money. And surely we've talked about um, with, you know, withdrawal rates here uh, uh, on numerous podcasts and numerous um, uh, articles and such. Uh, and, and of course, the lifetime calculator allows you to uh, identify specifically you know, what withdrawal rate you want uh, uh, while you're calculating uh, kind of a, a time horizon. So, so Craig, how is this different from the the rest the rest of us uh, who have some sort of a plan? Um, we have some sort of a withdrawal rate that that we hope will work. What makes this group? Now, some people call it the fire group, but uh, financial independence retire early. But really, when you when you dig into it, it's really about getting financial independence. But what is unique about this community? So um, the biggest thing in my mind is that there's an idea that at some point in our lives, we will hopefully reach a threshold where we no longer have to trade our time for money. So right now I'm a full-time employee and I have to do at least 40 hours a week and I'm trading my 40 hours a week for a salary. Right. Um, and so financial independence is really focused on uh, trying to identify how we can live our best lives um, and uh, see how you know, money as a tool can, uh, can be used so that we don't have to continue to, to trade our, our time for money every, every week or every month. Right. Um, and so some tenets of the community are, as I understand it, and, uh, I guess I'll get to, I'll get to my, uh, input on how I got here in a bit. Uh, but some of the tenets include trying to save aggressively. Um, so for the, the earlier parts of my uh, career, you know, after recently graduating, you know, the recommendation was to save 10%. Uh, of of my income in a 401k. I was a government employee. The government did a match. And so, you know, I had my 10%. I would do that, you know, from my 20s. And then by the time I reached 59 and a half, um, you know, after a 30 to 40 year career, I would be able to have enough money uh, to live off of after that point. Uh, so that, that traditional path is uh, what I followed uh, for, for most of my adult uh, working life. Uh, about save about 10 to 15 percent. As I stumbled on, upon the financial independence um, uh, blogs and media and 
uh, I guess, uh, websites and articles and books, I realized that um, there could be a point where I, I don't need to work. Um, I've got enough money where I wouldn't need to work every day uh, just to, to be able to survive, to be able to pay my bills, to be able to raise my son or, or whatever I needed to do. And so uh, at that point, you know, I've, I eliminated all the debt by really aggressively tackling it. So student loans went away and, uh, and then I aimed to identify some things in my life that uh, were expensive, like owning a car. Um, I actually did a trade-off. I did a financial calculation to figure out if I should live closer to downtown or if I should have a car and live a couple miles out of the city. Um, and I realized that the trade-off was about 300 bucks. Um, per month in that I could get an apartment really close to the city center um, for that extra $300 and not have the mental um, anguish of owning a vehicle in a city <laughs> and having to commute. So these are just a few of the, a few of the things in my life. Um, but of course, you know, to be able to reach financial independence, we could save that 10% per year for many, many years, or if you save more, then you don't have to save as long, right? So um, common, a common target that is proposed by uh, the, the media uh, that I've read on financial independence is trying to target about a 50% savings rate. Hmm. Um, and so that's, uh, that's you know, a, a lot of money, of course, right? Uh, but if you can do that, then you know you could be financially independent um, within maybe 15 years or fewer. Uh, and so, someone who's in their 20s or 30s, um, you could re you could be financially independent and no longer have to trade your time for money every day uh, when you're 45, 50, you know, not 59 and a half, 65, 70. You know, and that provides some options. Um, it, it, well, my theory is that it provides some options where I could then take part-time work, or I could um, once I once I reach that, uh, have a, a different uh, relationship with work than what I have to have right now as a uh, as a full-time employee. So, Craig, you uh, you've been kind of following this um, call it methodology or this philosophy about investing for a while. Did that lead you to this conference that you recently attended? And I, can you tell us a little about that? Yes, definitely. So um, my journey really began um, about two years ago. I, I got a new job and uh, I got a significant pay increase, but I didn't change my uh, cost of living. So I had to figure out what to do with the extra money, which is a, a good problem, of course. Um, and that led me here to the Merriman Foundation. Uh, uh, and then I just consumed as much information as I could to see if it made sense. Um, if the pursuit of financial independence uh, is a thing that I wanted to, uh, to do for me and, and my family. And then uh, started to put the pieces into place. And the pieces, you know, included reading multiple uh, books that Paul has read, uh, written, uh, reading multiple books that Larry Swedro has written, uh, reading Two Funds for Life when that came out, um, <laughs> reading numerous Choose FI books and publications. I didn't, in my upbringing, um, I didn't have a relationship with the stock market. Uh, it wasn't a thing that I that we discussed. And so I really uh, was, I had, you know, I'm in, I'm in my mid thirties and now I've got a little extra money and I don't know what to do with it. So I had to figure out what is the stock? What am I actually buying when I, when I, when I buy a stock? I didn't know what an index fund was a, a couple of years ago. And so I've just been consuming as much information as I can about trying to diversify and take this defensive approach that, uh, that the organization uh, uh, recommends. And part of that journey included trying to find other people uh, who are on this path. And so uh, I recognized that, you know, I'm just a guy sitting in a small apartment <laughs> reading a whole bunch of stuff. 
and uh, and reading forums and um, and blogs and books and listening to podcasts. Uh, and I didn't have anyone to talk to uh, other than my I have a brother, a brother and sister. And so but they didn't really get it. Um, they're, they're thinking, what, you're saving half of your income? And I, I said, well, that's what I want to do. I don't know if I can do it. Um, and so I, I had this need to, to engage with people. Um, and, and so that led me to understand, you know, what's available in, in my community and in my neighborhood, uh, what resources are available, you know, through forums or uh, kind of um, mass video calls or podcasts. And, and then I got uh, interested on this Chautauqua uh, conference. And so Chautauqua is a gathering of about 30 people. And there, this year, there were two one-week sessions. And uh, participants were able to sign up for one slot um, for you or you and a partner um, to, uh, within, that, within one of those two weeks. And so this was my opportunity to really try to engage with um, other people who are pursuing this uh, this financial independence idea, and in in some ways, um, you know, it feels like we're swimming against the current because it's not a traditional um, it's not a traditional thing that uh, is widely known. Um, and and so I really wanted to change the conversation from a one way conversation where I was just consuming podcasts or books or websites or media um, to a two way conversation where I could start to develop a support group and a community that would help me uh, stay the course and be accountable. And um, I'm going to use this phrase a lot tonight, uh, but to I, I really want. I really wanted to figure out how I could live the best life possible. Um, and finances are one component of that, right? And so this Chautauqua uh, conference um, really allowed me to meet uh, many, many um, people who each have their own story uh, and um, everyone that I met is you know, incredibly talented and uh, pursuing uh, in, like just phenomenal things in their lives. And finances are just one part of, of living uh, a, a tremendous life. And, um, and so that's really what this conference uh, was about. It's it's not a, a cheap a cheap venture, is it? I mean, for somebody who was working the numbers to figure out whether to rent or get a car, um, this represented a, a sizable investment because you traveled internationally, right? To to do it. Um, so so tell us a little about where it was and uh, and whether you thought it was worth it, <laughs> or yeah. or how you ran the ROI on it. Yeah. Yeah. So the. Um... So the conference, uh, and I recommend, uh, we'll have the link, I'm sure, in, in the, the publication of this uh, video and podcast. Uh, the conference is Chautauqua, um, and we have to sign up for the newsletter. So the newsletter, they send you uh, some kind of information on when they'll announce the next Chautauqua and when you can buy tickets. Uh, this event sold out in 18 hours. So uh -huh. I got an email mid morning um, and I churned and said, oh my God, can I afford it? Can I afford it? And uh, I didn't, I actually had to dip into my emergency fund because I didn't have the cash on hand to, to do it. But I, I, um, I had made the, the decision 80% of the way before they announced it. Um, and then spent about four hours, you know, kind of feeling what, what did I want to, what did I want to do and what would be the, the outcomes that I could achieve um, during the during the event, and uh, I'm glad I, I signed up before I went to bed because as soon as I woke up the next morning, the thing was sold out, um, wow. and I suspect that the next year will be the same. So, uh, so that was kind of the 
if you're interested, I recommend, of course, go to their website and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, we get very few emails. It's really just focused around um, when the when the event is going to be run and where the event will be run. Uh, this Jared, year, it would, yes, please. Is this is this a specific finance or financial independence Chautauqua? Yes. Or is, is this just Chautauquas in general? It's um it's focused on uh, financial independence. Yep. Okay. Thank I've you. been to a Chautauqua up on Lummi Island. They are. I mean, what what I went to was was not financial. It was it was entertainment. Uh, I mean, there's a huge history on the on Chautauquas and how they're used to, to gather people together. But but yeah, the, I mean, I don't I don't know of any other Chautauqua that's focused on on financial inf, inf, information. It is by the way is why the Chautauqua? This is J L Collins. Uh, the, was the the fellow that put this all together? Yep. So J L Collins, who um, you know wrote the Simple Path to Wealth, uh, uh, decided to have a conference, and it's it's kind of the pre- a premium conference that's focused on financial independence. And he started it in 2013, is if I remember correctly. Uh, and the intention was just to have a very small group of people uh, get together and have cool conversations in a cool place. And so they've held them all over the world. Uh, this this past year, it was in Colombia, um, in South America, and uh, it wasn't actually in Bogota, which is the capital. It was four hours out in uh, in the mountains, uh, in a in a small historical village called uh, Via de Leva, uh, at a at a resort there. So the trip, of course, you know, was from the United, uh, a flight from the United States down to Bogota and then a, a taxi or a bus from Bogota out, you know, four hours into the mountains. And it was incredible, um, the location that Alan and Katie chose this year. Uh, it was high in the mountains and um, just very beautiful and historic town that uh, that was full of uh, scenery and people and um, nature that, uh, you know, something I haven't ever experienced before. Did it, did it change your focus at all? The, did it change your goals? Did it change your steps? Uh, and, and what would, what would those changes have, have been, Craig? Yep. So, uh, so just to note, it's, uh, 2022. Uh, I signed up for the, the conference in February of this year. And it was held in uh, early September. So that's just kind of a, a note on timing in case someone's listening to this uh, a few years from now. Yeah. Um, so going into it, I really just wanted to identify um, I, I had three outcomes. The first one was to make sure that the things that I was, the, the assets that I was saving in um, made sense. So I kind of wanted to validate for me uh, what I had what I the plan that I'd come up with here in partner kind of by listening to the Merriman Foundation um, and and reading a bunch of other things. The second thing I wanted to see is if my calculations were correct on how long it may take me to reach financial independence. And then the third one, which is of course the most important one, was to develop um, friendships with the other attendees. And the reason that this conference is so empowering is uh, there are are about 30 of us. And so we know everybody's story because we interact with everybody. It's a very small uh, conference setting. Um, Everyone, you know, everyone that is is in that group has self-selected. They were all probably on the newsletter already, you know, already aggressive savers. And so throughout the conference, you know, you could just walk up to somebody and say, how are you doing on your path to financial independence? Where are you? And some of the responses were, oh, we're just getting started. Um, some of the responses were, we just, uh, we just reached it, you know, or um, in, in others, it was, oh, we've been financially independent for three years and, um, and you know, we're doing X, Y, and, and Z uh, with that. Uh, interestingly, it was, it was fun because some folks had brought um, partners or spouses and uh, in some cases, you know, there was misalignment, as you talk about so often, Paul. 
where, you know, one person is gung ho and the other person is like, no way, this isn't going to work. Um, and by, you know, through all these conversations, uh, we get, it feels empowering to find a community of people who um, are pursuing hard goals like this and, uh, you know, seeing how talented um, and compassionate these people are and helpful they are in really trying to uh, build up this community. Um, uh, I, I can't say that enough because it, because we are you know, swimming upstream, um, we, we need other people to swim with us so that we can support each other when it's time. And uh, after the conference, you know, we are getting regular updates on uh, who's doing what, people are traveling, some aren't, some reach milestones, and it's kind of like uh, accountability um, partnership with, you know, 28 to 30 other people. So there are, there are in the U.S., I think Mr. Mustache has camps and, and, uh, oh, I can't think of the fellow out of Pennsylvania, uh, David and his brother have, they have camps in the U.S. Uh, have you thought about attending some of those camps? Because I think that's, that is the program they try to promote is, is getting the people together. And, uh, and sometimes they even happen in Oregon and Washington. So uh, are you going to try to chase those down maybe and find a cheaper way to do this? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I, I, I think I'm open to all of it uh, in my discovery. Uh, this just felt like the kind of the premium, uh, yeah. the premium one to pursue. And uh, so, you know, you kind of put a, you put a target out there and you say, well, maybe I'll make it one day. And sure enough, uh, the stars aligned and uh, I was able to go to that one, but surely if there, you know, there are local meetup groups um, uh, and there are choose FI Facebook groups. And so where I live, there are a number of uh, folks on, on the choose FI Facebook group. And as you, as you mentioned, there are other financial independence conferences that, that are available throughout the country. I, I imagine Craig, that since you were there with a number of uh, I'll call them respected um experts in the field of personal finance that there were some presentations and some some information delivered did anything stand out in that that you think uh you know were key learnings that would be of interest to the to the uh, to our audience here yeah so i think the the biggest thing um alan donegan and uh, and katie donegan did a couple of presentations on uh how to live an extraordinary life and uh, it really, it, it started with the premise that everybody in the room probably already has the money figured out. Um, and then with that you know, baseline, how can, how can we use money as a tool to, to really uh, live the life that we want to live? And so... Um, you know, imagine a day when, or I guess I, I imagine a day when I don't have to trade my time for money. Um, and uh, if there's a, if there's a thing that I want to pursue, then maybe I could go in that direction for a while or do some experiments outside of my uh, 40 hour uh, a week job. Um, and there's a skill inherent in, I guess this is a universal message, but um Humans like to to be productive and busy, and there's a lot of value in achievement. Um, and so, Alan really covered, you know, he really talked about that. How happiness, you know, include, you know, to be happy, we can't. It's not for most people. It's not just sitting around doing something. It's setting a goal, a hard goal, or choosing a quest to go on, and walking that, you know, walking toward that goal for a period of time until you slowly achieve it. Or if you don't achieve it, uh, evaluate, you know, where you are midway and then pivot to something that makes more sense for you. Um, and so uh, 
and actually Alan is running a course called the extraordinary life um, that uh, um, we can add a, uh, we can add a link to uh, in the, in the show notes um, that, that specifically talks about this, uh, you know, how, how to build the skills as individuals to figure out what we want to do versus what we have to do. And then as we develop an understanding of what we want to do and we experiment with that, then um, what role does finances uh, or what roles do finances play in, um, in that experimentation and, you know, truly actually pursuing and, and, and uh, living that, um, that full life that we want to live. Uh, it's really, uh, in, it's really interesting that we all have a version of great um, in our lives and my version of great is different than everybody else's version of great. Um, we have a version of enough, hopefully. And my version of enough is different than everybody else's version of enough, right? And there's enough, um, you know, enough uh, money. There's enough kind of um, achievement, you know. Um, and so as individuals, we have an opportunity to figure that out for ourselves and then um, arrange and purposefully pursue the things that will allow us to achieve and um, and develop the relationships, the the work, the goals, the achievements, the the finances that we want to be able to have. You know, this full um, existence. I well, Greg, somebody you- somebody told me recently that self esteem comes you know, not, not from praise, but it comes from self mastery, which is really tied closely to a lot of what you just said that, uh, you know, true, true joy and happiness really comes from being useful and being helpful and, you know, being of service and accomplishing things. And I, I, you know, among my friends who are farther along on this curve than you, most of them are considering when to retire. It's interesting to watch them grapple with not do I have enough money, because most of them do. Uh, their concern is what will I do that's worthwhile? Yep. And it's a really interesting dynamic to see people grapple with that. So I'm, I'm glad as a younger person, you're already engaged in trying to figure out well, or, or, or the realization of gosh, I have all of these wonderful things that I could do that are worthwhile, above and beyond the 40 hours a week that you do for your for your job. And wouldn't it be nice if you could put more time into them? Yeah, that's really cool. Yep. And so, so since um, uh, since this uh, this conference, and Paul, this kind of answers your earlier question. Um, I've been really focusing on trying to develop the skills for me to figure out what I want to do um, that that would kind of um, be worthwhile. And so a very maybe funny example of that is um, I love to bake. Um, And so I found a really difficult cake book, uh, like a professional chef had, uh, had written. And, uh, and I, my quest for the next year is to bake every cake in that book. And there's about 33 or 34 cakes in that book. (laughs) That's great. And Uh, every cake is like five to six different things. And as it happens, um, I just, uh, I just finished a cake last night that I took to work today, um, that had, (laughs) had, you know, six different components. And, um, I'm really, I'm learning so much about, about, you know, making creme brulee and making, (laughs) uh, you know, chocolate ganache and mirror glaze and all these things that I had no idea about, um, (laughs) Just through this, you know, through this quest. Uh, well, I, I love to eat. There is absolutely nothing funny about your pursuit there. That's a very serious pursuit. My my uh, son has been working on the perfect macrons and he does a wonderful job and they are not they're not easy, but that is a serious pursuit. So stick with it. <laughs> yeah. And it, it brings me so much joy because I get to I get to improve my skills. Right. Yeah. Like I still can't make like straight edges on the cake. I got to figure out how to like actually ice Tricky. a cake correctly. <laughs> so like my cake this today was really lumpy. Um, and so, but with each cake, I'm learning new skills. Uh, the one last night had a, an almond brittle and I'd never like uh. dealt with, uh, 
with making almond chocolate almond brittle. I'd never done that before. And I burnt the first batch and I went, oh my goodness, I got to go out and buy new, new almonds. Um, and then, uh, and, but now, you know, after burning a batch, you know, I got the second one right. And, uh, and now I know how to make almond brittle uh, as a result. That's great. I, I, I am curious. Uh, I live this life of passion doing this thing I do every day from about three o'clock in the morning on trying to figure out how can we help more people. And I used to think that these people who were focused so seriously on, on financial independence, I mean, they would take the time to figure out where they should live, whether they should own a car or a, I mean, all the things that you're doing. And, and I thought, this is going to be a slam dunk to help these people do better with their investments over the long term. Now, of course, they kind of have a short term. In many cases, they're trying to retire by the time they're 45 or 50. And and in some cases, I know because I've attended the meetings, uh, they'll be happy if they can retire at 60 instead of 65. So they're not all trying to retire at, at age 40. But 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 I guess the, the 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 question I have: Do you get a sense why it isn't easier to reach these people with the ideas of investing that 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 we're presenting? So I think it all comes down to trying. I mean, so I found the Merriman Foundation. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll just give a, an anecdote about my philosophy. Um, and, and this may be uh, similar for others in pursuing financial independence. Um, very often, if I can learn a skill that will serve me for my entire life, then I'll invest the time to learn that skill and then to hone it over years. Um, so that I can, you know, be good enough in, in what I, in what I, uh, in, in, in what I need, uh, to live my life. So, um, for an example, I, I know how to change oil, right. In a car. Um, I know how to rotate tires and, uh, even though I don't own a car anymore. Right. I, I, I knew early on that, you know, it'd be pretty valuable for me to learn how to just do basic maintenance um, so that I could take this asset as long as I can, can have it. Uh, and then that extends to, to other things. Um, uh, and so when I knew nothing about investing, uh, I first uh, tried to figure out, you know, how can I put money somewhere where it's not gambling because that's kind of how I grew up is thinking that the stock market was similar to Las Vegas. Um, and then once I found out that, you know, there are ways through, you know, the, the common things that we share here around index funds, broad diversification, uh, overall a, a defensive strategy, right? Um, then I realized, oh, this is a skill that'll save me 1% per year at least. And that adds up like crazy. Um, so I need to, um, I need to really kind of figure this out for me, and that'll add up to tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars over a fifty to you know fifty year period. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's my mindset. And as I've consumed the financial independence uh, media, uh, I see that that's kind of a common theme where you know, there are a lot of do-it-yourselfers in this community. And it's not necessarily do-it-yourself investors. It's do-it-yourselfers in everything that makes sense. Uh -huh. right. um, and so that's, uh, that's how I got, you know, got involved with the Merriman Foundation. And um, I think the, the media on financial independence that I've read has been... Um, really valuable. And I, uh, I suspect that to answer your question, it's 
uh, you know, a matter of exposure and trade-offs. Uh, one of the themes, so I don't know if everyone in the audience uh, knows J.L. Collins, but The Simple Path to Wealth, uh, he wrote a book um, and in a blog series uh, on, his, on his blog that really focused on trying to minimize the impact of finances on your life so that you can live, um, well, basically, so you can, you can forget about it and then do the things that you want to do instead of focusing on your, your portfolio. And so his strategy is really um, two or three funds all in Vanguard, you know, total market or total bond indexes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the messaging there was how can you make it as simple as possible? Um, and for me, uh, I wanted to, yeah, I, I'm of course following what we have promoted here at the foundation, the Merriman foundation. Um, and so it's a bit more complex than three funds, right? I have, um, probably eight to 10 accounts, uh, that I have to manage instead of one at Vanguard. Right. Um, but for me, I feel that it's manageable and, um, and the reasons are that, you know, I believe in, in what we have uh, discovered through the research, you know, around diversification and this defensive idea of, um, so the extra burden of managing more accounts is worth it to me, I guess. And it's worth it to my, you know, I've got an 11 year old son um, and it's worth to manage money for him as well, based off of the teachings here compared do, to. Do you mean more accounts or more assets, more, more investments? Both actually. Both? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's because um, I, you know, I have to have an individual investment accounts. I have to have tax deferred accounts um, and they're across a, a number of different companies um, okay. because of my working history. I've had to oh, yeah. have um, accounts right. at Fidelity. I've had to have it with the government. I've had to have it with um, uh, other um, brokers, I guess. Uh, so there's, you know, as I said, there's eight to 10 probably across multiple brokers, um, you know, re stratified by tax deferred and taxable. So I've, you know, I've been confused about that, making it simple, been confused that if a person set out to find the way to make it most simple, and yet the best it could be while being most simple, I can't understand why they don't end up with a target date fund as the recommendation. Uh, that, that it just confuses me. Uh, and, and, uh, because, because that is a well, single fund. Some, some of these authors started working before target date funds were a thing that may be part right. of it. Yeah. Um, but also it could be that, um, with a target date fund, you're, you're dependent on the equity, uh, asset allocation of the target date fund. So that Yep. There's a trade-off in the flexibility of your bonds versus your stocks in your portfolio. Um, so Although maybe that you can you can kind of address that just by checking picking a different date in the target date fund. Um, so there there's a lot you can do with it, but I I think for many of the uh, these kind of legacy strategies that have been around a while, the target date fund just wasn't a tool. Um, wasn't I mean, now it's so ubiquitous, it's hard to imagine coming up with a strategy that doesn't at least acknowledge that an investor is likely to hold some in a target date fund. Um, but I think that's kind of now going forward, not necessarily looking back. So Daryl, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you started saving relatively young. You were a student a serious student of how to invest. I know you attended more than one of our workshops at the Merriman Company. Um, what's the difference? What do you, What is the difference between what you were as an investor 
and what the financial independence people are? Well, when uh, I first seriously started investing in 1981, when I was 30 years old, and uh, that was the time when individual retirement accounts first became available to the masses. Um, I guess they had been available before, but they were only available to selected a selected segment of the population, and I don't remember the details as to what that was. But um, at that point, um, I <laughs> I just happened to be sitting next to some people who were interested in investing, and so I found I did find out about the uh, AAII mm. at that time. And uh, I had found some other books that I had looked at and, and I dabbled in different strategies and being the analyst that I am, I looked at some of them and I said, you know, in theory, this looks good, but I don't see how it's going to work in real life. And so um, I kind of didn't do some things and did some other things. And uh, I just kind of fumbled my way around until probably about the... Oh, early 90s or so for the first 10 or 15 years. Um, I saved a lot. I tried to, I saved what I could um, in my for, in my IRAs and my 401ks. Um, and I saved a little more and I opened, opened a brokerage account, but I just kind of fumbled around. I didn't have any real direction um, until probably the, the, late 80s, early 90s, when I started maxing out my 401k and maxing out my IRA contributions and, and putting some additional aside. Uh, and so it, I just I just kind of overcame my ignorance by throwing as much as I could, well, as much as I as much as I did into savings. I probably could have could have saved more, maybe not 50% like Craig, but <laughs> But I could have saved more, but it turns out that I didn't need to um, by the time I got done with everything. And then I discovered, um, I think the first time we actually met Paul was in the early 80s sometime. I, th I, I seem to recall it was a, a uh, maybe it was the mid 80s. It was a, a seminar you did over in Spokane at one time. Mm. And, uh, and so I started looking at that and I said, well, it's kind of interesting. And I actually have your book over here in my bookcase uh, that you wrote in 1983. I forgot, Lifetime, what is it? Investing for a Lifetime. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so I started to look at that and read that and it, it sort of started to sink in. Um, there really was no analog to the fire movement at that time. Um, so you kind of were on your own to try to figure these things out. I wish I, in some ways, I wish I would have been born like 30 years later, 30, 40 years later, because a lot of this stuff would have been around and, yeah. and it might have helped. On the other hand, because of the timing in my career, I did, I did live through some really interesting and challenging times in the career field that I chose. And so that was, that was worthwhile. But uh but yeah, I, I ended up spending a little bit of time in spreadsheets looking at, at different kinds of approaches and, and the uh, diversification approach, equity, uh, equal equity asset allocation approach, because you don't really know who's going to win, who's going to do worse, who's going to do better, um, sort of appealed to me. And uh, by the time I was probably... Well, it was I was probably 50 by the time I I ended up getting seriously focused on on trying to get ready to retire, which was a little late because my goal was to be able to retire when I was 55. Um, now, because I had saved so much, it turns out that I I probably could have um, at 55. I just didn't appreciate it until afterwards when I when I actually had retired and found out how much. Uh, how much you actually need versus how much you think you need when you retire, at least for us. That may not be the same for everybody. But um, so, so what it, I mean, it seems like a, maybe one of the aspects 
of this financial independence group that makes them different is the degree of focus. Yeah. It is it is not just the focus on the saving, it's the focus on the number. That number that that isn't that what they what they say, Craig, is they call it the number that they need to be able to change their life and go from being a worker B to a uh, life B or whatever they, whatever the words might, might be. But uh, maybe that's the big difference. It's just the degree that, because there you were in, in, in essence, Daryl, at that same point, but you weren't yeah, I, focused. I think it's, I think it's the degree. See, I was focused on being able to walk away at 55. Um, a lot of, a lot of today's uh, fire uh, people are focused on, you know, 50 or 45 or 40 or even 35. And, uh, and you can, a lot of times what it boils down to is what is the level of expenses that you are willing to accept to live the life that you want to live for the next 40 or 50 years or 60 years even. And uh, and so my benchmark had been to uh, sort of try to balance the the lifestyle from before to after at a level that I and my wife would be uh, satisfied with is probably the best word to use. So, thank you. Uh, that's I think that's great, Daryl. And and. Uh, Plus, Craig, plus, I must say, yes. I really liked my job. I really liked what that's, I was doing. I, and, I was, and that makes a big difference. Yep. Um, I won't say that I would have done it for free, but but for but for the last probably half dozen years or so after I had run the numbers and looked at it and said, you know what? I I I probably don't really need this job to to live anymore. And and my mindset changed. And I didn't care about the so much about the uh, the overhead burden of working for a megacorp, and and uh, and I could just kind of let it roll off my back because it didn't matter if it just got too much. I could leave the next day, um, and that that made a big that made a big difference um, to the mental mental outlook on life. Yeah, I felt much the same way as you were talking about your experience. I feel fortunate that I think 80% of my career I enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's there's about 20% where I wasn't a good fit or the manager wasn't a good fit or something wasn't a good fit and it was very frustrating, but 80% of the time uh, it was a joyful part of my life. I really it was a fun and stimulating way to contribute. And so that makes that makes it less urgent to get out early. Yeah, I would say probably in my case, it was probably 90 or 95 percent. I Lucky. remember very few times when I just was up to here with it and I was I was ready to go. Um, that didn't have that did not happen very often. I was very fortunate, incredibly fortunate to be able to have a job that I just loved doing. It was very challenging and great people to work with. I was depressed one afternoon of all of the time that I'm, I've, I've always loved to work and, and, and enjoyed many different kinds of jobs in my career, but I got super depressed. I went out and spent some money on my wife and everything was okay. <laughs> I swear that. And I went on and got back with it. I well, am, the the I fact am, that you're still doing a lot of the same work in retirement kind of speaks to how much you yeah, loved it. It's just, it's great fun. Craig, with your commitment to this financial independence, does it matter what you do for a living to get there? So for me, yes, because... Um, I want to live the best life that I can. So everything that I do now is a decision um, for today and for tomorrow and for 10 years from now. Right. So, um, you know, that common adage where the, you know, the goal doesn't matter. The journey, you know, is what counts. 
uh, I want to live a day. I want to live a day-to-day existence that's fulfilling, knowing, of course, not how, not knowing how long the days will last, right? Um, and so, for me, it's a balance. I, uh, I, you know, I do love the career paths that I've taken, um, and I've had numerous careers, uh, numerous pivots, and. Uh, the one that I'm in now, I'm enjoying, uh, and I'm doing my best to balance uh, the demands at, you know, I guess I should say all the demands that everyone, you know, listening probably also balances. Yeah. Um, and I would not take a job that I didn't love. Uh, and, you know, Right now, they align where I can have an aggressive savings rate. Before a couple of years ago, they didn't. Um, and in the future, they may not, right? But while I have it, uh, while I have this alignment, I'm going to continue to capture um, uh, this this kind of this opportunity and save aggressively. And I can't see anything wrong with that in, in, you know, in the long run, you know, if you save, you know, if, I don't know who said it, but this thing in my, it keeps recurring in my mind, you know, a dollar saved today is more than a dollar that um, you can spend tomorrow or in 50 years. Right. My, my dad grew up on a farm. He'd say, make hay while the sun shines. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, if, if somebody listening is intrigued about this conference based on what you said, and is thinking about going, what would your advice be to them in terms of how to prepare or or what to consider before they they commit? And and also if you're comfortable saying how much it was to go, that might be interesting too. Sure. Um, so the uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, uh, probably about $6,000 all in roughly, including the flights. And uh, I stayed an extra day in Bogota so that I could acclimate to the environment before going up to the mountains. Um, so uh, for those who are interested, I think uh, definitely get on the newsletter for the Chautauqua website uh, so that you're informed about this conference. Uh, we'll also have resources to financial independence um, websites and books that, uh, that would be available for you to, to read. Um, I think it's important that folks who go to this um, make sure that we aren't taking on debt to go to a thing like this, right? Um, for example, if, if, if a person can't afford to go, you know, because they're already in significant debt, then pay off the debt because you're not ready, right? <laughs> um, uh, because it, you know, this is a, this is a thing that uh, it's important to be in a place where you're ready and already pursuing, I think, uh, in uh, a situation where your finances are kind of positively trending. Uh, so you, uh, many of the people, or I guess I should say all the people who've attended, um, knew their their balances in all of their accounts. You know, they had a strategy for investing. They... Um, I, we didn't specifically talk about it, but I suspect that uh, very few people had, you know, active debt that they were paying other than maybe mortgages. Um, clearly, you know, credit card use was uh, really for points because it was paid off at the end of every month, <laughs> right? So um, I believe it's important to get uh, a story, uh, get a financial plan or develop a financial plan. Um, and develop your why and live that out with conviction for a while so that you can uh, have experiences in common with everyone else that's attending. And, um, and then you, and even if you have a spouse or a partner who wants to go with you, um, have a clear set of outcomes you know, just like any any project or any goal or any uh, journey, right? Um, purposefully 
discern what you want out of it before you uh, before you take the first step and why discern why you want to take the first step. Um, it will change through the journey, but uh, really kind of getting to know yourself and what will make you happy, um, I think it are super valuable things that we can uh, that we can use when walking into a conference like this. So Great Craig, stuff. Great. I have a question for you, Craig. So this conference was in September, right? So it's been a couple of two, three months now. What has been the impact of the things you learned at the conference on your life now, three yeah. months later? So, um, so I haven't changed anything in my savings or my investment strategy. Uh, so that's, that's good, right? Because <laughs> my investment well, it depends. Plan... It depends. That all what that means is you were doing the right things before, right? <laughs> exactly. And I wrote down, you know, I I found a, an investment policy statement that I wrote down for myself uh, yep. in March of 2021. I guess it, uh, we're in we're in early December 2022 right now. And he um, did not cash out all of his holdings to put it in the total market index. No, 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 and I still don't own any cryptocurrency. More Bitcoin, right? In the yeah, FTX right. crash, that's good. That's good. Um, and so, uh, so my finances haven't changed. What's changed? You, you know, I, I really am trying to look at my life with the intention of the full lifespan. Right. So much of what we do at the organization here is thinking like. Um, that end date is like 95 years old, right? And so uh, I have, you know, 50 to 60 more years ahead of me, if that's my end date, who knows? And so one of the things that I've learned, or one of my kind of views is to think about the totality of my life and what I want, who I want to be when I'm 95, and then what can I do today so that I can get there when I'm 95? And one of the outcomes of this conference was the realization that I don't really know what makes me happy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know that what makes me happy now is way different than what made me happy five years ago. And it's going to be way different than what makes me happy when I'm 95, right? So one of the outcomes is really trying to figure out the habits that I can develop now so that I could figure out what's going to make me happy for the next year or the next six months or the next 24 hours, right? Um, and this idea of trying to live an extraordinary life has, you know, the, the, the process is really trying to identify um that discernment. So what, you know, what am I doing? I've, I've written a list of 35 goals of things that I want to achieve in my life. Um, wow. And, and you know, that wow. was an activity that, uh, that Alan asked us to do. And this baking quest that I'm on was one of those goals, right? <laughs> and do you need um, any help with that? I'm not that far away. Yeah, That's true. And I'll, <laughs> and I'll drive up to help too. <laughs> Yeah, and so and so then I've done um, probably six of the thirty cakes over the you know the last few months, and and now I'm still trying to actively journal and say, well, what what else would be, you know, when this quest ends, what else would make me happy? Um, and I thought, well, you know, what if I try to be on the Great American Baking Show? I don't know. Sure. Hey. Yeah. Why not? Right. Well, then yeah. what would then what would I have to do? Well, I'd probably have to bake a lot more other stuff than cakes. <laughs> and so, so I'm actively kind of in my journaling process right now, um, considering like a goal of, uh, I, I don't know if you all are watching, but the Great British Baking Show, right? they have, oh, a, oh, oh. They yes. have a website and yes. they have all the recipes from all of the technical challenges that they've done. Wow. Oh my God. And so I thought, well... Do I want to go on that quest where I bake all of the technical <laughs> challenges that have ever been done on the Great British Baking Show? Well, if I do that, then I could probably be on that show in a couple of years. 
Um, and so these are the, you know, but would it make that me would, happy? That would be must see TV, by the way. <laughs> oh, good. I know that guy. <laughs> so, but, but again, it's, um, you know, that may or may not make me happy. And it's my responsibility. And the thing, the outcome that I'm learning is that, you know, money is just one part of it. Uh, happiness is, is, you know, not linked to money. Money is an, an enabler in many instances. Too much money is like negative. That can um, be a disabler. Yeah. And so what's the sweet spot for me? How do I figure that out? And then how can I um, try to live the best life, uh, you know, in that balance and figure out what the best life means to me today and tomorrow and the day after that, you know, until, until it's over. Did you, by chance, when you put together that list of 35, include anything about doing a blog, telling the story, the, 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 the trip that you're going through? Um, no. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. I, uh, I just didn't, uh, I wrote something like write a book, you know, um, pass on knowledge to the next generation, you know, that kind of stuff. So Great. maybe it'll be realized that way. I don't know. Did but, uh, you know, another thought that came to mind as I heard you talking that through is it's hard to predict what you're going to be like in the future. Um, but you can talk to people who are ahead of you on the path. It might be interesting to interview some people who you think, uh, you know, outside of the conference, who you think have uh, got a life that looks fulfilling in some way and find out, well, you know, how did their tastes change and what do they like? And um, Most definitely, yeah. Just a thought. Craig, you've uh, shared a lot of great stuff. Thank you. And uh, Did you have something on your list that we have not, you've not had a chance to share that, that because uh, I, I know you're a list maker. I am a let list us maker. Not, let's <laughs> not a, let us not keep you from your appointed rounds. What do you got on that list? That you so, want? the most important thing is I wanted to just speak directly to the audience, the, the folks that are watching or listening um, to this uh, this video or podcast. Um, I know that we have been so focused on finances, and um, and we have these, you know core um, assets and lessons that we share uh, as the foundation. Um, for me, those are incredibly valuable. And I realize that community is also as valuable. Mm -hmm. That finding a confidant or a partner, like an, an accountability partner or um, a, men, a mentee or a mentor, is what really um, will keep me on the course. You know, I, we preach buy and hold, do it yourself, right? Yeah. Well, it's really hard to buy and hold. Um, and for me, it's important to have a community who I can tap into. Not a, not just a one way community, but a two way community, right? We aren't financial, you know, we aren't financial advisors. A lot of this conversation is one way where we're putting content out into the world. And for me, I've been receiving so much gracefully. And a huge realization is that um, I need to have two way conversations so that I can be successful in this lifespan. And I encourage you to consider that in your world, right? There's so many people who listen to this for entertainment, I suspect, or they listen to it so that they could um, kind of gain knowledge. Some people are mentors to peers or to um, younger uh, or to youth. Some people are grandparents or parents saving aggressively for their kids, right? Um, and uh, and that, uh, all of that is community, right? All of that is community that, that drives um, out of this resource that we've created. And, and I feel so honored to be part of, you know, this part of the conversation. Um, 
And it has been so powerful for me to understand the role of this information gathering and the podcasts, and then see how I can go out and have conversations um, and develop relationships and deepen existing relationships based off of what I've learned. Um, so I have a, you know, within my family, I've shared, um, you know, my, my dad actually talked to Paul a few months ago, um, which was incredibly exciting for, for all of us. Um, and, and he's, you know, he's now a regular listener. And when we talk every week, I, you know, he's like, Hey, what's going on in the Merriman foundation. And, uh, and so for those who are, who are listening, um, I kind of a key takeaway that I'd like to Rec- recommend is to see, you know, how this information is impacting your life and what brings you happiness in it and from it. Um, who brings you happiness with this information and how does it show up um, for you? Be it, you know, just an entertaining thing that you listen to on the way to work. That's, you know, great. That's awesome. You know, it, and maybe it's more, maybe it's that, that, you know, you're standing in line with a coffee and you say, um, Hey, I, you know, where'd you go for vacation? Well, I went to Columbia. What the heck were you doing in Columbia? Well, a conference on financial independence, right? And, and, uh, and then that sparked a, com- a few conversations at work where, uh, you know, other people that I had no idea were also, you know, on a similar path. Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing for me is just to really um, capture that and to reflect on it and see where it goes and where it takes you. Uh, Well, you are a jewel. Chris, you're a jewel. Daryl, you're a jewel. I just can't, I just cannot express how thankful I am that you guys are in our life. And I know from the emails I get that the people who do spend time with us appreciate the, the approach and the attitude and the, desire to help others so thank you as always you are great and uh and i hope i hope we can find an opportunity for you to attend one of these groups that uh is here in the u.s so you could report back to us and tell us whether there's something uh, that people could go to that would be a similar kind of experience because um, it sounds like something a lot of people would like to do. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you, Paul. I, I have to say, um, you know, you enable so much uh, in me. And th- these two years that I've been on this journey with, you know, with you and, and uh, I guess a year and a half now with Chris and, and Daryl, um, it's been profound. And I just feel so fortunate that, All of the content existed before I got into it and all of the lessons, you know, were available for me to begin to uh, consume, you know, that these libraries, these troves of, of knowledge, um, you know, they continue to, to grow and we continue to learn and um, the pursuit of over the last 10 years that you um, and your family have, have enabled um, has really had an impact on my life. And um, That's very kind. Thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate it. Well, listen, happy holidays to you guys. I don't know if we're going to be talking like this again before, uh, before Christmas or new year's, but um, uh, thanks very much. And, and uh Enjoy your wonderful lives. You've helped us all a lot. Thanks. Well, thank you too, Paul. All right. You got that, Chris? You know, I learned something very important tonight. We don't talk to Craig enough. He feels so detached that he had to go all the way to Columbia (laughs) To find somebody to talk to about personal finance. (laughs) That's wonderful. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.